Hey everyone, welcome back. This is episode 4 of my Learning to Program PLCs with Structured Text video series. Uh, if you watched 1 through 3, you should have learned about what IEC 61131-3 programming is, how to set up an environment to program in IEC 61131-3 with uh, Beckhoff TwinCat. Uh, and you also should have been able to log in and run and, and get your code actually executing on the processor. So starting from there, uh, I want to talk a little bit briefly about operators, data types, and then we'll write some code. So first, the uh, this is a list here of all the operators. Oh, sorry, not all of the operators, the most basic operators. So you've got greater than, less than, less than or equal to, equal, not equal, and or not all these different things like you would expect in pretty much any programming language so it's got most of the common ones uh, there's a huge list out there but uh, this will sort of get us started for this episode here so moving on to uh, data types uh, I'll just kind of skim over some of the ones I don't use very often uh, and then the ones I'm going to cover in later episodes I'll sort of skip over as well so um, boolean is a really important one basically it's a single bit on or off um, you can use these to set flags, you can use them to set hard outputs like a cylinder extension or lights or anything like that. An input, typically a digital input, is going to come into your uh, system as a boolean. So really important to know how to work with them. Um, that moves on to byte, which is a string of eight booleans. So if you look at this calculator here, this is the standard Windows calculator but in programming mode, which I find pretty useful from time to time. So <coughs> I'll go ahead and throw this in byte here, and you can see it's 8 bits long. So I'm not going to get into major detail on that, but just know that a word is now 16 bits, and a D word, which is this data type here, is 32 bits. So something to know about the way this particular PLC system works is since it's a 32-bit processor, typically most data types are defined in 32 bits. There are some exceptions to that. Um, I believe byte is defined as uh, 8 bits at a time, and a bool is, strangely enough, actually takes up 8 bits as well, but you really only access one of them. So um, it's sort of a, a strange nuance of the way they do their code. So an integer here is just a, a stores a number. So this would be an 8 bit. It can store plus or minus, so that would be a signed integer. And S here stands for short, short signed integer. So it can hold the numbers negative 128 up to 127. That includes zero, which uses up one of the, uh, the numbers there. So I never find much use for these, uh, like S uh, int, small int, unsigned cent, int, unsigned int, and actually dent I do use quite a bit. And the reason I don't use these particular four here is that you're always going to end up taking up 32 bits worth of data anyway on this particular system so a dent makes a lot of sense basically it's just a nice number you rarely run out of data here um, it's my pretty much my go-to for just an, a whole number now if you want to do decimal numbers like uh, 1.2534 or, or pi 3.14 you would go real and that can actually store a really large number but they're not incredibly precise, if that makes sense. Um, you can tell it to store a number, and it's going to store the closest approximation of that number that it can. Um, anyway, long reel uh, is a 64-bit reel, I believe, which is um, not used very often, at least not on in my experience. Um, string data type is a uh, just to store a, a an ASCII string. So typically it's, uh, I want to say it's 8 bits per ASCII character and then it's terminated by a, uh, a null, meaning um, eight, 8 zero bits in a row, I believe. Um, so time, time of day, date, date and time, I'll skip those for later. Arrays, I'm not going to go into much, although I'll use one of the code in a minute. Pointers, we'll talk about later. And names we'll talk about later. Alias and structs, we don't need. Structures we will talk about later, but anyway, so that's the gist of it. Um, hopefully, you understand sort of how this binary system works. But very quickly, if I've got a D word and I want to set it as a decimal, and I want to do uh, 125 as a decimal, and I want to see what that looks like in binary, I get this, or more more importantly, this in a 32-bit system. So <clears throat> it's going to come in and do all. It's going to this would be like a um, 
a dent, which would you know be assigned. You would have plus or minus values, or you could assign this as a U dent and 32 bits. That would hold a larger over overall number. So like dent here can store that big of a number. U dent uh, can store a much larger number uh, by a couple order, orders of magnitude there. So. Uh, anyway, there's some merit to knowing what these are and understanding them, um, specifically the difference between real, dent, bool, and uh, string. So those are the, probably the most common four that we'll use. So I'll show you some examples of those here in the code in just a moment. All right, so we've moved back into uh, TwinCat3 here. We have our same project from last episode, same main program, but I've extended it a little bit uh, to add some variables in here. So um, you put these variables up at the top. You've got var here, end var. You can also have var input, var output, var in out, which is an input and an output, uh, and some other things, var constants for constants and things like that. So that would all go up here, but we're not going to worry about that at the moment. Um, so this is our basic program here, and uh, you'll notice maybe I've left off a, a semicolon. So Basically, I did that on purpose so that if we compile here, you can see that we've actually got an error in the compiling log down here. So um, make sure that if you can't get online, you check that out, you double click it, it'll take you to, it says semicolon expected instead of value. So just make sure if this happens, you go up to the line before it and see what you missed, um, at least for that particular error. Um, it's a real common thing to leave these out by mistake or misspell something so this error log is pretty essential when you get to try to go back online and run your code so um, here we go I'm gonna go through some of these um, these data types and uh, so I've got a heartbeat which is a dent we defined that in the last episode uh, it's just gonna chug along adding one every PLC scan so it sort of acts as a scan counter just lets us know it's alive it doesn't really do anything for us at least not in this case so moving on uh, I've got a basic assignment here. So this is setting I value equal to 10. So I value is a dent type, so it can be a whole number. It cannot hold something like this, would be an error. It can't handle that because it's a dent type. So I've also got a basic string assignment here, which is setting my string equal to hello world. So it's worth mentioning here that a string data type, if not specified, is by default, in my system at least, 80 characters. Uh, so that's going to take up 81 bytes in memory, I believe. Uh, we can check that later if we want to. But um, So this, you can actually say this is a string 255, or you can go on from there actually and just make a huge string on this. Some, of, some systems are limited to 255. I think Rockwell Software's uh, PLCs are limited to a string 255 as their maximum data size, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So um, Anyway, I've also defined an array here. Uh, this is more just so I can show you what a for loop looks like, but um, it's worth knowing that you can array any data type. Um, you can do multi-dimensional arrays and, and all that good stuff as well. So I've made an array of dents, which basically is 10 dents in a row. So. Uh, and they'll actually be next to each other in memory every time when you define them like this, which is actually really helpful. We'll talk about that way later on. So uh, I've got another dent here and another string. So into the code, my basic assignment, I can set a value like this. So this is the actual assignment operator. And you can assign any value of the right type. So um, we'll do a very uh, a basic if statement here. So this is what they look like, like in most other other coding languages so if b run math you might wonder why I have a b there for run math it's sort of a, a convention I think Hungarian notation or similar to that um, some people love it some people hate it I kinda was forced into using it on a project by a customer and I actually really ended up liking it quite a bit so the idea is that you, you predefine all these b is a boolean i is a integer um, s is a string up here and then I usually put array in front of arrays. That's a really helpful one to know something's an array. And you think, why wouldn't you know? But you know, when you're looking through the code or it's somebody else's code, you don't always remember what all these things are. So any i, i is going to be an integer, and then a f is a float or a real. So um, I don't actually have any reals in this project or in this project right now. But uh, anyway, so what happens here? If run math is true, 
or we could even do this would be the same thing if one run math equals one or if we wanted it to be when it was false if not run math of course so if it's true I'm gonna add value one and value two together and move on if not I'm gonna reset value one to zero so we'll come back to this when I'm running the PLC and look at each one so with this for loop for I equals one to ten do and then I'm indexing this array here with the letter I and so since it's a 1 to 10 and there's an I here it will assign it to the value it had plus I which will be either 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 or 10 and so the interesting part about a for loop is when it runs it doesn't run on each scan it will go like if it's scanning like my mouse is it will go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and then go down and so you need to be careful with these for loops if you're doing a ton of stuff in them you can cause a scan overrun and so there's some ways to handle that like basically making sure you only run part of a calculation on one scan so you can sort of split it this system's so fast that I don't often have to do that but just keep in mind that uh, if you put a ton of math in a huge for loop, you might overrun the PLC scan task. So um, here's some string type conversions, or some rather type conversions is what I wanted to show. There's a lot of predefined functions here. You, at least in Beckoff, you can pretty much go from any type to any type. And so here I'm saying the dent that I have, I want it to end up as a string, and I'll take it I value one, and I want to jam that into a string. Uh, there are some other functions that will let you format things a little differently, but that's out of the scope of this video. So if you were to just do that, my string equals I value one, you're going to get a type conversion error. It's going to say, hey, I can't put that into a string. It's not going to work. Uh, let's see. Finally, the case statement is the last thing I'm going to run on this episode. Um, it's just like a switch statement in a, many other languages. So what it does is... I will set this value to something, 100, 200 maybe, um, and it will run the code. So as the code's coming down, it'll say, okay, I'm looking at I state as the variable. What, What is that value? Does it match 100? Oh, it doesn't. Okay, does it match 200? Yes, okay, it's 200, so S state now equals, and I just set this string, string equal 200. You could really, um, you could make it say anything here. I am to or whatever um, and so if it doesn't match either of these you have the option of putting an else on there and then you say I don't know it didn't match or you could say no match here and so basically if I set I state to 50 it's gonna end up running this code here this code never actually runs inside here unless that's true um, so that's about it Let's try to run this. My computer's been locking up a little bit um, with this version of TwinCat. I'm not sure. I've never seen that before. So hopefully this will go well and uh, we'll be good to go here. So I'm in the habit of activating here, but really if you just restart in run mode, you should be good. And what it's going to do is complain, hey, do you want to go into run mode? So I'm switched, I'm stopped, now I'm running. And when I log in, it's saying, hey, there's no program on here. Do you want to download it? Yes, we'll download it. So I'm not running here, you can tell by this heartbeat. So I need to click this uh, start button up here. So this is when the computer likes to hard lock a little bit, but we'll see if we can get through this one. So our heartbeat's doing like we did in the last video. No big deal. I have live values up here as well, which is really nice. You can also see the live values here, which is new in TwinCat. It used to be in a, a side view and it was awful. Uh, it was really bad. So anyway, you can see I value now is uh, equal to 10. My string is now equal to hello world. I can double click that if I want. I can change it, but uh, it's not going to actually let me change it because as soon as I do, this piece of code runs uh, a couple milliseconds later and it rewrites it. So anyway, don't be fooled by you know being able to write stuff in. You can force data as well if you want to definitely do that, but it, it's kind of flaky. I don't really love it. It works better on Rockwell, sadly enough. Uh, so the if statement here, we talked about value uh, 1 equals value 1 plus value 2, but only if this is running. So right now value 1 is essentially getting forced to 0. So I'm going to put that as a number here, and blop, it's back to 0.
expected. So if I run math, so I'm going to double click that, and it goes to true. I can set it for false as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and write that, and now I'm incrementing I value. As soon as it turns off, boom, we're no longer incrementing. So this line is not running if this line is false. That makes sense, right? Moving on, the for loop here. So we went through this a minute ago. What it does is it's a little harder to see this inside a for loop when you're online uh, because it doesn't know what value to show. It's just like, uh, I don't know how you reference this. So um, you can come up here and actually expand that and see. So what I'm doing, it's doing kind of a funny trick where it's it's adding I. So for the first array, it's adding one every scan. This one, it's adding two every scan. This one, it's adding three every scan. So you can see it sort of cascading upward into bigger numbers as it goes. So I just needed something to show off this for loop. So keep in mind the important part to remember is when it comes into the for loop, it assigns all 10 of these values and then moves on to the rest of the code. So it's not doing one per scan. It does them all. So you can really drag the PLC uh, processor out if you're not careful with those. Um, keep in mind with a while loop, those are valid syntax, but I've never used a while loop in one of these. And maybe in a, in a specialty task you would, but a while loop, are, they're kind of scary because if the condition never comes true, you've basically hard locked your PLC. And on these, you can't even connect to them anymore. It's pretty bad. So I avoid while loops at all costs. Um, I've, I've never had a need to do one. You can always, I mean, you're inside a big while loop that's always running and chugging along anyway. So uh, you can usually just, just run like that. No problem make a new program for it and then it's its own while loop so um, anyway type conversions uh, we talked about this I value equals zero now oh, because I left this off let's turn him back on oh. so you can see this string of course now matches so you can see it's got the quotes around it the single quotes that's because it's now a string so it will uh, continue to convert that every time be careful because these uh, string things, and especially like string concatenations, can be pretty processor intensive. Not like that you need to worry about using them, but if you put in a whole bank of them and run it every single scan, it's it's just a waste of resources. So try to be sparse with those if you can, or, or trigger them when they change, and then don't write them every scan. That's a way to do it as well. So. Um, Moving on through the case statement here, I promised you that if I put 100 in there, that it would say 100. So boom, my state shows 100. So this is the only line running right now. I state 200, of course. Blop. I am 200. And then we go, oh, it's 8675309. Uh, Blop. No match. It doesn't know. So. We'll do state machines using case statements in another video. I'm going to devote a whole video to that because it's really important uh, in my opinion. So um, anyway, we have not hard locked the PLC or the uh, my PC, which is awesome. So uh, I think that was about all I wanted to show here. Um, stay tuned. Next video, I'm going to dive into timers and maybe some triggers and things like that. We're going to actually start simulating some stuff and, and doing real code. I just had to kind of get through this to uh, show you how it all works and show you how the online changes work and the uh, compiling errors and all that good stuff. So hope you learned something, and uh, I'll see you on the next video.